you can't ask people to go back from cards to cash now. Because someone really needs to just take a look now and see if you look end to end, how robust is our power system? So hello everyone, welcome back to Heart of the Matter with me, Stephen Chia. Now, you know, on the 14th of October, a Saturday here in Singapore, for those who, well, live only in the cashless world, they were suddenly broke. They had no money. They could not buy anything because two banks, DBS and Citibank, experienced a service outage. Their customers could not use their credit cards, could not take out cash from the ATM. So it literally meant that they were unable to buy anything. Uh, they couldn't even take the trains or buses because, you know, we generally tap in. It's like their buying power all of a sudden ceased to exist. And cash was once again king. But the irony is, well, there are very few kings around these days because who really carries cash, right, in this day and age? So what goes on when cashless options go dark? Who is to blame? Is it realistic to expect that there will never be any outages ever, especially for a system that has millions of transactions happening every second? Well, that is our discussion for today. With me in studio today is Dr. Patrick Thung, Principal Lecturer of Information Systems. He's also a director in the Master's Program for Financial Technology and Analytics at SMU. Thank you. Mr. Ashish Kaka, Research Director for IDC's Financial Insights in the Asia Pacific. IDC works with financial institutions on their payment infrastructures. Hello. All right, gentlemen, welcome. So let's start off with uh, the results from a bit of a mini survey that my team did. We asked our followers on Instagram to share some of mm. their stories about their you know, situation on Saturday. And we got more than 1,400 replies. Mm. Most of them said they couldn't transfer money, couldn't use their credit cards, get cash out from the ATM. Uh, one of them were, was at Ikea buying furniture. So with furniture in hand, she was stuck, unable to pay for it as well. Tried to use GrabPay, but couldn't top up GrabPay because it was linked to her DBS account. Mm -hmm. So actually, it shows that everything's kind of interlinked in terms of our payment systems. Mm -hmm. Has the infrastructure gotten too complex all in the name of convenience? Patrick? Uh, digital banking today is far more complex than it was about 30, 40 years ago. And uh, we're getting increasingly significant number of transactions uh, that are very dependent on a digital. In the past, you could just write a check. Banks really have to rethink uh, the uh, high dependency of the uh, customers, including individuals as well as corporates, uh, on the increased risk of uh, customers going out of cash. So yes, uh, systems today are definitely much more complex. We have much more delivery uh, channels. Um, and then uh, we every day, you know, it's constantly on 24 hours. The question here is that everything is linked. So I use mm. A to pay B to transfer to C. Mm -hmm. And it just goes on and on. Mm -hmm. Ashish, I mean, have we made things uh, too, too interlinked in that sense? Well, in a way, we have made things interlinked. But in a way, it's... If you ask me frankly, I don't think it's right because it causes the customer mm -hmm. issue. Now, in an ideal world, which we've all grown up with, which is using MasterCard and Visa or other payment systems, you wouldn't have that interlink system, right? Whereby you would need to top up GrabPay, etc. Mm -hmm. So... In my view, yes, it's interlinked, but it can be simplified and it needs to be simplified because you can't have customers facing a problem. Right. Mm -hmm. So so you're saying it's you feel it's too interlinked and that's no good? That's no good because you need to simplify it because if it's too interlinked that people are not able to pay for food or they get stuck in the parking lot or they get stuck Correct. without taking a taxi. But, but then the, the banks will argue that this makes things more convenient for customers. You can make things convenient by making it simple as well. You don't need to kind of create a link between your bank to a grab pay. You can maybe just pay through your bank. Right. Right. So maybe you just don't need to kind of link it to a grab pay. You just use a grab by bank's app to pay. Now, what you need to do is to have a resilience in the bank's app that when the systems go down, mm -hmm. the app still works. And there are ways in which it has been worked out that the app can still work. So you can still have an on behalf service that gives you an author authorization. Okay, wait, what is this on behalf service? So you're saying my app doesn't work, my credit card doesn't work, but there is another option? There is another option. So typically what used to happen is that the associations used to give something called a stand-in 
processing system, which is an on behalf service. Mm -hmm. So if your bank is unable to give an authorization, the credit card association, which is either a MasterCard or Visa, can step in and give you an authorization. Now, the whole challenge is that that authorization comes with its own limits. So like if in your own system, if you get a 90% plus authorization with a standard, you may get 60 to 70%. But that reduces the problem significantly. So instead of 100 people okay. facing a problem, now it'll be 30 people facing a problem. So you still can't buy things like a Prada bag worth $2,000, <laughs> right? But you can pay for your food. You can get out of IKEA. You can take a train. You can right. do all those things, right? So it's almost like having someone, an alternative option to step in when things go wrong. That's exactly. Right. And yeah. in, in fact, banks do uh, that uh, frequently in a uh, different mode. For example, in this case, if the data center is down, uh, banks actually have what we call the offline mode. So offline mode meaning that you're not dependent on the data center and they actually have alternate subsystems that are not linked to the data center and that's why you still can continue continue uh, operating, uh, going to the branch, withdraw money and deposit. Eh? But uh, obviously, banks do take a little bit of risk with that because sometimes the account balances are not updated. You may withdraw more than what you have. But usually the risks are quite minimal. Okay, because it's kind of like them mm. saying, okay, I'll just mm. give you the money first even yeah. though I'm not sure how exactly. much you really have, right? That's right. And, and banks will have an idea of the kind of transaction uh, amount and the risk of loss as well because, you know, they've been running these operations for many years. They will have ideas that, look, you know, a typical uh, consumer coming in, you know, withdrawing right. this amount, that will probably be the maximum loss I will incur. So the question is, do you want to incur the wrath of the consumer versus giving them the convenience but with a bit of risk? And that's the kind of okay. trade-off they have to consider. And, and you know, in, in a banking world, you anyway are taking a risk, right? So mm. if, you're, if you're using something on a credit card, mm. I have no assurance you're going to pay me back. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just, I've done a risk al calculation where I think you're a good profile, you'll pay me back, right? right. But I'm taking a risk. Now, if I can mm. take a risk on a normal purchase when the system is down, mm. why can't there be an offline authorization? The only thing is someone needs to come in mm. and give that authorization. And that's the role that associations have typically been doing in the past. Right. Mm. So so they could actually come in and say, okay, mm. so for yes. everyone, every customer, mm. we'll just cap it when things don't work, mm. we'll cap it at $1,000 each, right. for example. That's right. And they could still use that money until things get back online. That's right. Okay, so let's track back a bit and try and understand. So what actually went wrong here? Maybe, Patrick, we understand that okay. it was something to do with the data center. Yes. Explain to us what actually happened. Okay, so without actually going into the depth or the facts of the actual case, uh, several things can actually happen uh, when data centers go down. Number one, uh, it could be the hardware, the mainframe, uh, the servers. It could be also the software. Okay, Or in the, in the third uh, scenario, the infrastructure. So in this case, I think it was reported about the infrastructure, which is the cooling system. Now, uh, data centers uh, need a very cool environment so that the equipment don't overheat, right? So I think in that case, I think there was a problem in cooling system. So I think in order not to have equipment damage and then there will be long-term consequences, they decided to actually start to shut down the uh, data center. However, before you start shutting down, you already make plans to switch to what we call the alternate data center. So most uh, big organizations like whether it's DBS, CD Bank, Singapore Airlines, you know, they actually have what we call dual or sometimes three data centers. So you then will plan for a swing from data center A to data center B. Right. Okay. But I think probably as we experienced the failure, it means that the swing was not successful. Okay. Yeah. So once the swing is not successful, then uh, you get this problem where, you know, the uh, equipment are down, uh, your ATMs are down, your payment systems right. are down. Does, does so, so something like that happen automatically? Does the system automatically okay. start shutting down or does mm. someone have to say, okay, I make mm. the call, let's mm. move from data center A to B, right. let's do it now. Okay. So it all depends on the sophistication of the data centers. Data centers are rated uh, uh, tier uh, N plus 1, N plus 2. The highest tier is N plus 4, okay? Mm -hmm. Meaning that uh, the downtime is very minimal, meaning there's a lot of automated uh, decisions, but they're using very high-end equipment. So any uh, bank using a tier 4 uh, 
data center will obviously pay a lot of money to ensure that the automation as well as, as a swing is done as seamlessly as possible, but it always comes at a price. Yep. Okay. So most banks, uh, big banks, are probably will be in the tier four uh, type of data centers, right? But having said that, uh, there's nothing foolproof about that, meaning that uh, they potentially they could be putting in some new applications or new infrastructure during that time, mm-hmm. and that may interfere with the uh, automated swing. Actually, how are the data centers linked to the banks? Okay, so if you think about it, uh, uh, a data center basically, you know, is this building, right? But it contains uh, really sophisticated hardware, software, storage. Now, most data centers are practically highly automated. You hardly see many human beings in there. Not like 20, 30 years ago, you can see 20, 30 people, you know, loading disk drives and all that. Right. These days, uh, we use uh, uh, robots uh, to actually load, you know. So this is highly automated, so number one. So what's in, in there will be obviously many of your applications. Example, one of the key ones is your core banking system. So the core banking system is a piece of software that, you know, records your loans, your deposits, you know, your general ledger and all that stuff. That's what we call the core banking system. Now, the core banking system cannot work by itself. It has to be linked with all the other applications, credit card systems, payment systems. Okay. So all these are actually put in the data center, right? They contain many of these applications and then they are actually also network. For example, your branch teller systems, right? Right. So branch teller systems have some of the applications on the branch itself and some of the same uh, similar applications is run at the data center. Okay. Now, once the data center is down, the connectivity to uh, uh, is lost. Right. So, so which means that the branch cannot operate anymore. So from what you're saying, it mm. sounds like the data center really is mm. the heart of yes. everything. It's like it the operating system, That's right. which mm. all other aspects rely on and link very, to. Very. So if the heart goes mm. down, the CPU in that sense goes down, that's right. everything else cannot work. Yeah, that's right. But uh, modern days, you have two hearts. Ah. So if one heart goes down, hopefully the second heart keeps pumping. Right, okay. Mm. Is it fair to sort of expect that these data centers be flawless and work 100% of the time? Because we are talking about millions of transactions happening every second, right? right, right. And in a way, it's still a machine, a computer, and yes. if it gets too hot, it just says, I'm yes. tired, I can't work anymore, I need to shut down. Ashish? Well, you know, frankly, when you do your data center planning and your application planning, you normally plan for a certain down- downtime. Yeah. So there is a there's a whole uh, what you call as a continuity of business or disaster recovery planning that mm-hmm. every bank has to do. Right. It's a part of a regulatory mandate, and in that planning, you estimate saying that my authorization system can be down for X hours. Like the MAS requirement is four hours; it can't be longer than four hours, mm-hmm. right? So within four hours, typically a backup has to come in. Okay, now ideally, and what actually surprised me in this case is that the whole maintenance actually happened during a daytime. Mm-hmm. Because normally when we used to do a migration or we used to do a maintenance, right. it used to be always in what we call as the green zone, which is you do it typically around midnight to mm-hmm. around 5 a.m. Yep. So when there's a downtime... When most it, people are sleeping mm-hmm. and When most people are sleeping the and system, they're not right? using, right? Yeah. To, to come back to the question, yes, the downtimes can happen, but that's why the disaster recovery platforms are there mm-hmm. and someone has to manually call that so mm-hmm. that's a that's a reason you've given the three or four hours to say that look within four hours it can go up uh if you look at the recent work which is basically the world bank work ever since covid has come in they've been insisting on a two-hour downtime and australia is actually doing that for the high-end treasury the far the high value transaction system they've actually okay. come down to a two-hour downtime wow so they've actually so it is it is logical to expect a downtime. Yeah. yeah. That's a different kind of, that kind of downtime you're planning for it. Right. Yes. You know when it's gonna happen, you have everything set, okay, press the button, let's mm. fix let's ma- do maintenance now. But in mm. this situation, mm. it, obviously it well, it didn't seem like it was planned. Mm. Can we expect that? And can we okay. do we understand why the backups, the alternatives did not work? Okay. So I just uh, add on to the point, uh, uh the MAS actually is quite uh, clear about this. Huh? Four hours downtime 
of critical systems. So first question is, what are critical systems? And this is four hours within a period of 12 months. And this is what we call, they allow this as uh, uh, unscheduled, uh, uh, sorry, unscheduled downtime, meaning unplanned for. Whereas if you have planned for it, called a scheduled downtime, you can have 10 hours, 12 hours, right. right? So in this particular case, it was unscheduled. And I think it just was more than four hours. So to the extent they have actually uh, breached the TRM uh, notice, the technology risk management okay. uh, So, So in other words, you're saying when, when something goes wrong, yeah. they have four hours to kind of get it all sorted exactly. and get it back online. Exactly. And in a, in a year. So, you know, if these are critical systems. Now, question is, ATMs, teller systems, these payment systems, these are critical systems because generally they are customer facing. So you don't want to inconvenience your customers, whether companies or individuals who are making payments. So that's why it's important that uh, uh, most uh, banks are very, uh, uh, they, they pay uh, deep attention to not uh, breach the uh, TRM uh, notice. Well, not just for that, because they know that every minute they're down, they lose exactly. tons of money as well, exactly. right? So there's an incentive for all. Mm. But DBS, this isn't the first time they've had a glitch. In fact, this year they've been a, a yes. bit unfortunate. Mm. In March, they had a glitch. Uh, the yes. bank's mobile apps, the website was down for one whole day. And then uh, less than a, a week after, another one in October, um, they had another, the PayLa mm. service was down again. So, mm. So considering how much DBS is, uh, is sort of linked to Singapore and Singaporeans, we almost all have an account there, mm -hmm. is this going to have very uh, serious repercussions on them? What do they need to do? What is it that they're doing wrong? Would you be able to speculate in that sense? Okay. So to increase robustness of any systems in any organization, particularly with banks, right? There are several things that we can do to uh, minimize the downtime risk. Number one is uh, rehearsals, uh, recovery procedures, disaster recovery planning, and actually do an actual simulation. So question is, how often do they do the simulation? Mm -hmm. And two, uh, how wide was the scope of the uh, simulation test? That's one. Number two, uh, the uh, people. Obviously, you know, you cannot depend everything on uh, automation. Judge, human judgment comes into play. Is this uh, a problem that is likely to result in a major outage? And if it is, you know, what would be some of the human intervention decision making that you've got to do too, right? And uh, thirdly, uh, uh, the use of uh, advanced technologies, for example, uh, using artificial intelligence to be able to predict that uh, there is likely to be a major downtime and so that you can have sufficient time to uh, rectify or do something about it before it's too late. Okay, that makes sense. That should have some warning signs along the way saying, right. oh, this thing is beginning to mm. act a bit funny and you That's should right. be alert. Yes. But Ashish, I mean, one would also say that now after this incident, uh, I, I would just go and perhaps get a credit card from every bank out there, just in case. <laughs> Will that solve my problem? Or is there the concern that again, in DBS and Citibank, they both happen to be using the same data centre? Mm. Look, I think one is changing your consumer behavior or getting the consumers to change your behavior is not a solution. Mm. What you have to look at is why isn't the data centers or the infrastructure resilient? You can't ask people to go back from, from cards to cash now. Well, MAS did kind of say, now you should carry a bit of cash with you. <laughs> <laughs> look, I don't know because look, in my case, I'm not used to carrying a cash. Nobody right. in my family is, right? Yeah. And unfortunately, we all bank with DBS and Citibank, right? So, okay. so yeah, so... But yeah, it's, it has to be more of, you can't, you can't solve a problem by creating another problem, right? Because mm. if you have more credit cards, you have to look at more mm. payment cycles, you have to look at, you have to keep a track of more cards, you have to mm. ensure that you're paying everything on time, right? right. Mm. So you got, you got to basically solve the problem of the infrastructure. Right. But again, I guess at least you are spreading your eggs to several baskets so that if one thing doesn't work so well, like if I have two cars, one car doesn't work, I have the other car. No, but right. the question here is, uh, look, why didn't the on behalf come up, right? If on behalf mm. came up, the, the exposure would have been li limited, right? Mm. And again, in case of data centers, and my friend would know much better than because he's managed data centers yep. than I have, but typically when you look at data centers, you talk about different structures. One of the structures is hot hot. So for critical... That's right. Critical functions cannot be hot hot. Hot mm. hot is when mm. the two centers work together. Mm. So if one goes down, the other one is there to support you. Mm. So that's okay. also a 
engineering technique that you can look at, which is sure. basically for certain critical functions like payments authorizations, mm -hmm. ATMs, you keep a hot hot. Okay. Which is the two centers are working together. One authorization is going here. One authorization is going to the other center. So if one goes down, the other one is there. Yeah, yeah. it's a it's a, it's a little bit more cost for the banks, mm -hmm. right? Which is the reason they don't do it. Which is the reason they typically keep the one center running okay. and the other okay. one mm -hmm. not working. But is that the right cost mm -hmm. for us to pay? Right. So so in other words, you're saying actually it has nothing to do with our consumer behavior, and we shouldn't have to change our behavior in that sense. Um, mm. Instead, it should be mm. the banks who should be able to ensure that there's mm. always service, regardless of what happens. And in this case, you're saying the on behalf system or basically alternatives should have kicked in. Should have kicked in. Right. And in this situation, it's because it didn't kick in. But then again, who can ever guarantee that A, backup B, backup C, all work. One That's day, true. maybe... <laughs> They all go down. Right. So I, I take an alternative view, which, which I call the common sense view. Okay. Uh, which means simply that, look, you know, whilst uh, we are increasingly very reliant on good technology, the very fact is that, you know, uh, nothing ever in life is certain, uh, except death and taxes. When I was at the World Bank, uh, we actually run very critical applications. We're lending money to uh, third world nations. Mm. So we actually plan uh, what he's just said. We use the term active, active meaning that uh, two data centers are active and we share the transaction load to these two machines. So at any one time when one of these machines is down, one of active one is down, active two will continue, but it will take more load. So when we do data center we planning, we also make sure we plan the capacity. That means if suddenly uh, active uh, center two has to take the full load, Okay. Is it able to you know, uh, have the CPU power, the storage, and, and, and all that? So uh, coming back to the common sense uh, approach, uh, uh, I remember just before COVID, I was invited to China uh, to, with the uh, PBOC, the central bank, uh, head of digital banking. And so we had a forum and then my topic was how to ensure resilience of uh, digital systems and all that. So I said to him, I said, look, you know, I observe in China, the situation is even far more automated, you know. You go to a shopping centre, everyone practically used a QR code or phone and nobody carries cash except me as a Singaporean. When I was there, I had to use cash and pay. But anyway, I said to the digital head, I said, aren't you very dependent not only on data centres but on your telecommunication networks? Mm. If that network is down, That's right. your cashless just cannot work at all. So uh, as a central bank, you know, uh, are you ensuring that you are working with the telecommunication regulator to ensure the robustness of your network as well. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we actually have the same situation in Singapore. It's not just about data centers, the telecommunication network. If that's down, uh, you know, uh, you yeah. know you've, you've had it. You've actually brought up a good point because even if the, the credit cards were working, if suddenly my telco was down, exactly. I could would not be able to connect and use my app. Or exactly the machines will not be able to talk to the banks and, and right. everything goes down. Right. So are we looking at a much bigger picture? Are we talking about an entire infrastructure sort of support? Mm. I mean, is there yes. is there another option? Look, and in a way, you're looking at a much bigger picture because you're looking at even, let's say, the underwater, under mm. ocean lines because our telecom is actually coming from the ocean flows, right? And mm. sea flows. And you've had cases mm. where there's been earthquakes and those lines have snapped. Mm -hmm. I remember way back in 2007, eight mm. with Taiwan and Korea, the whole network right. went mm. down because the whole line snapped, mm. right? So that you're looking at. Secondly, what you're looking at is exactly to the point that you brought out, right? So while you can create a resilience in the banking system, you're getting a lot of these e-wallets, whether it's a Grab wallet or right. a Gojek wallet. Now, obviously, these are not run by banks. So mm. even if you get the banks to create a resilience, mm. how do you get resilience in these mm. wallets? Let's mm. say... If you're storing your entire money with a Grab wallet yep. and Grab wallet goes down, if a bank goes down, there's obviously a noise, right? Mm. MES gets involved, people okay. get involved. You look at resiliency, you say that, how, why, why, why wasn't it active, active? Why didn't the on behalf come in? But what if a Grab wallet goes down and your mm. entire savings are there? Someone yeah. needs to take a whole view of mm. this entire technology, right. okay. which you can't control the underwater wire snapping. 
Right. But you can control the banking networks. You can control the data centers linked to the bank. Mm. You can control this whole e-wallets because my risk, which I'm seeing, is not in the banking. Banks mm. will yeah, be able to figure right. it out, right? Mm. Banks have done it for so many years, they'll be able to do it. Mm. It's these e-wallets which are coming up Okay. Where you don't, you may not even have a backup system. Right. Mm. But I'm sure in time, there will mm. also be some regulation to, you know, uh, monitor the way those uh, operate. But just as we wrap up, because mm. we are running out of time, I mean, if you look at our entire system now, would mm. you say we are in a good space? I mean, are we effective enough that these things w should not be happening anymore? Or is there more that Singapore needs to be doing now? Because now when we talk about it, it really is an entire infrastructure. It's not just a, a bank, it's, it's a telco, it's, it's everything actually. Sure. So how should we look at this moving forward? Patrick? Okay, first, uh, I think there's the micro and macro aspects. The micro aspects meaning that, you know, the way you do the, uh, disaster recovery planning, business continuity planning, you need to continue doing that and making sure that the equipment, the hardware, the software is working. You have proper change management processes. I call the micro view. And making sure that all banks somehow do that well. That's one. Huh? Number two, you need to have also the macro view. Macro view, very similar to what I say the government Government says a whole of government approach. Eh? So actually, uh, frankly speaking, our infrastructure are all very interlinked. Eh? So I think maybe it's high time to re really look at a holistic uh, view. Uh, as I said earlier before, right, the telecommunications yeah. players and then the uh, players who are not so much regulated by the banks, their wallets and all that stuff. So someone really needs to just take a look now and see, hey, you know, uh, if you look end to end, how robust is our power system? Uh, how does that then, if it's down? So we need to actually have what we call scenario planning and that's where uh, macro planning, scenario planning will actually then help you anticipate the issues and then figure out you know, what you need to do. But if you want to make a 100% foolproof robust system, it's going to be very expensive. Right. So the question is, how much do businesses are prepared to uh, spend to minimise the risk versus uh, inconvenience to customers. So that's a kind of review that also has to be done. Eh? As you said, Steve, before okay. that, uh, increasing uh, reliance on digital systems and payments and uh, banking. So I think uh, a review also has to be done uh, from that angle. Look at the significance and then uh, estimate what's the loss if a system is down for this, right? Not just business. Okay. And look at the total picture. Yeah, and be prepared for, exactly. for the changes. Ashish? Well, for me, it's more of a question of branding. So for us mm. in Singapore, mm. we've always been considered the best in class mm. everywhere, right? Mm. Now, here is a question where we've spent a lot of money in building these nice digital ecosystem without looking care of the, taking care of the infrastructure. Mm. So I guess it's a time for someone to kind of incentivize people to mm. go and look at the infrastructure to come up with certain ideas around that, mm -hmm. right? Because if you look at the entire digital ecosystem, that came in because because people were incentivized to look into that, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it was in the banks or somewhere else, there was a system where if you come up with a new digital solution, you mm -hmm. would make some money. Right. Mm -hmm. That same thing didn't happen with infrastructure. <laughs> infrastructure uh, may have low-hanging fruits. It's just that we just don't know what they are. Okay. So right. it, it almost sounds a bit like you're saying we, we keep adding on more new things which ride on the same old infrastructure. Exactly. Perhaps it's time to, to also look at reinventing the infrastructure. It's, it's like what happens with the trains, right? So, so when we didn't change the infrastructure, yeah. we started getting into the train downtime. So mm -hmm. you're seeing that in the banks. Right. So the question is, do you want to continue with the downtimes or do you want to now take a look and say, hey, let's take a look at the whole infrastructure and say, okay. maybe it's a little bit of spend but maybe incentivize someone, but get it yeah, running. Yeah. But maybe this this so-called crash has been a bit mm. of a wake-up call yes. and hopefully that will spur mm. them to do a bit more. But yeah. I know for myself, I mean, I've always done this anyway. I often keep like $10 in cash just in my in the glove box of my car just in case I forget <laughs> to bring my wallet. At least I can still buy lunch. Uh, maybe I'll up that to $50 now. <laughs> maybe <laughs> well, you should consider $100, $100 with, with inflation. Maybe day, right? Yeah, so we can all do that just in case. Well, I think uh, we, we don't have a, a solution here today, but it has shed some light on just how it all operates and perhaps uh, for the rest of us users out there to also think about our own uh, considerations when going about our daily lives and to be prepared to know that we can't expect things to work all the time. There may be that rainy day that comes along. 
Thanks to my guests for coming in and for all of you listening is if you like this episode, please give us a shout out, drop us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. The team behind this podcast is Jessalyn Tan, Jacqueline Chan, Tiffany Ang, Joanne Chan, Saya Win, and Crispina Robert. And I'm Stephen Chia signing off. <laughs>